This week on The Climate Show, how do we power all this when the sun doesn't shine and the wind doesn't blow? There's a clue in the scooter. And welcome to The Climate Show with me, Tom Heap. And this week I'm hitting the town in Liverpool, not to cut loose, but to see how we keep the lights on when energy demand is high, but renewable power is low. Also this week, a new report reveals that we're pumping out more single-use plastic than ever. So, after years of campaigning and David Attenborough documentaries, why do we find it so hard to bin the plastic habit? First, climate-friendly energy sources like wind and solar rely on the weather playing ball and when it doesn't, we fire up costly and expensive gas. But as I've been finding out here in Liverpool, giant batteries may help solve that problem. Just as we finish work, our electricity system really puts a shift in. Whether it's a night out or home for your tea, it adds up to the early evening being peak daily energy demand. At the Abbey Road Sports Bar, the team are warming up. The manager knows customers are drawn to the light. Even just walking down, you know, the outside, we, we want to attract our customers and lights are an obvious way to attract our customers to come inside. And keeping them demands yet more power. In our kitchens, we've got fryers, we've got grills, we've got our fridges. Then coming into the, the bar area, we've got screens throughout. We've got lights on the ceiling, we've got our fridges keeping all the drinks cold, so yeah, plenty of uh, appliances throughout kitchens and the bar. How important is electricity to a venue like this? Extremely important. I mean, people aren't going to come here to sit in the dark and have no entertainment or nothing to look at. Keeping clean, green energy flowing through these things night and day, rain or shine is key, and right next door to here is one of the solutions to that. Welcome to Europe's biggest grid-linked battery. Sky News has been given exclusive access just after switch on. Can we have a look inside? Yeah, yeah, of course. All of these containers have all of the equipment in that we use to power the local area and across the grid. And how much power can you store here? So, in terms of the capacity of the site, a good example, especially for a battery storage company like ours, is if you were to charge 1,500 electric cars, you would use the whole capacity of the site. Electricity generation can be patchy with spikes and troughs, especially in an era of renewable energy. Energy users need it smooth and consistent, otherwise the lights dim or the wires can melt. So what's in here? Hi, well, this is where this battery site connects to a super grid transformer. Wow and onto the national grid. That's a good reveal. That's a hell of a connector you've got there. <laughs> it is. So this is connecting up to 275,000 volts, and this is the largest transformer to be connected to a battery storage site in the UK. Places like this remove the lumps, saving money and carbon. Well, there's a huge amount of renewable power that's connecting onto the grid now, and that causes quite a lot of challenges because it's not very consistent. And so what this site is doing is taking all that power and sorting out those challenges with intermittency and then putting that power back onto the grid in a very consistent and predictable way for the national grid. But also it's shutting down the gas peakers that are currently operating. And as a result, we save huge amounts of CO2. One costly quirk is when there is too much solar or wind energy, generators are obliged to turn off and paid to do it in millions. Sites like this are going to reduce the amount of curtailment. This site itself will save somewhere between 50 and 100 million pounds to consumers over the next 15 years. Though this plant cost many tens of millions, storage on this scale is only affordable now because of the boom in electric cars has made batteries cheaper. A good thing as our renewables heavy future rests on storage. We're going through one of the biggest changes in our energy system of all time at the moment, moving away from fossil fuels and increasingly 
towards renewable energy, which of, of course is variable. So having energy, energy storage in the system is going to be a really vital component of how the system works in the future and makes and stays in balance to provide electricity for homes and businesses. Renewable energy is the future and I think that battery storage is a real opportunity. It offers so much flexibility on the grid. So for you, this stuff is as important as seeing a solar panel or a spinning turbine? Just as important, yeah, exactly. Energy storage is one of the hottest areas of green tech right now with thousands of inventors and companies working on ideas far beyond batteries. One of them involves this stuff right here. What? You can't see it? That's because I'm talking about air, liquefying air. One company involved is Highview Power and their CEO Rupert Pierce reveals the secret. Well, the easiest way to think about Highview Power is to, is to think that we're a freezer. We're a freezer for energy. So we take the renewable energy that otherwise wouldn't be usable in the grid and we use that power uh, to freeze air uh, and store liquid air in very, very large tanks, 50 meter tanks. Uh, and that frozen air is ready to be warmed up uh, to become electricity again. We can hold those tanks uh, full for weeks uh, or months at a time, back end of the cycle, when the energy is needed, we allow the tanked energy to warm up, the liquid air becomes air again, we drive it through a turbine and it's used to make electricity. So it's renewable energy in, use that energy to freeze air into liquid form, store the energy as liquid air, and then warm it up when needed and drive a turbine to become electricity again. It's brilliant in that it allows us to capture the wind when it blows, but the market isn't there for it, store it, and then recycle it back into green power all over again when it's needed. And then there's this. Not just the inspiration for Sir Isaac Newton, falling things are a source of energy, and Scottish company Gravitricity wants to use that by having very heavy weights in very deep old mines. We're looking to utilise uh, either existing mines or new shafts to suspend a solid weight. That weight is suspended via cables and attached to electric winches. When there is surplus electricity on the grid, electric winches can be turned and the cables which are attached to the weight allow that weight to raise. When the weight is in, the, in a higher position, it is storing electricity in, in the form of potential energy. When we want to give electricity back to the grid, the weight is lowered using the energy that's stored with gravity, and that in turn rotates an electric winch, which turns a generator and puts the electricity back onto the grid. We've identified that across Europe, there are a significant number of mines which are closing at present, so they're reaching the end of their service life. That presents a really interesting and exciting opportunity for us to repurpose these end-of-life assets. There's something really nice about knowing the energy infrastructure of the past can be repurposed to help us with our transition to the cleaner electricity grid that, that we hope for. Well, another storage idea that I've heard about is something called a sand battery, using an incredibly widely available and pretty cheap material. Now, the people who are really ahead of this are the Finns, and I'm joined on Zoom by Marco Ljonen, who's uh, developing this thing. Marco, what is a sound battery? To simply put it, it's a huge uh, container containing hot sand that is used for well, heating up homes or potentially industrial processes or well, whatever that requires relatively or medium to high temperatures. So this isn't about electricity, this is about heat, but heat is incredibly important in our energy story, isn't it? Heat accounts to something like 70 or 80 percent of the uh, emissions in the energy sector. Well, if you look at almost any manufacturing process, uh, heat is involved and quite often it's produced by burning gas, oil, coal, well, combustion based anyway, and also heating up homes. It's a significant factor in, uh, in, well, in global CO2 emissions. And how do you get the energy into the sand and how do you get it out? We have a really simple approach to heating up the sand. As nowadays, we have a lot of wind power and, and solar power available. 
we have a lot of clean and uh, affordable energy. Well, sometimes it's it goes even to waste. So it means that sometimes electricity is rubbish. We use simple uh, resistive heating elements to, to heat up air that passes through a piping system inside the sand and, and therefore heats up the sand. So instead of wasting that energy when you've got too much, uh, too much wind, for instance, you can literally convert it into a, into a heating element that's then heating air that goes through the sand. Yeah, well, uh, resistive heating is something, well, as old as anything related to electricity. Uh, so I think simple it's, technology. I think it, it's the old uh, bar heaters for, for people of my age can remember that <laughs> those used to be in our homes. Or indeed what made old fashioned light bulbs hot, isn't it? It's, it's what made the filament hot and glow. Exactly. We get the energy out by using the exact same piping system. So our product is then hot air that we can put into, well, many different kind of uh, well, directly inside into a process. One of our more important sectors in the industry has now been, for example, food and, and, and beverage industry. What, what kind of food and drinks are you talking about there? Give me some examples. Baking bread requires something like 300 degrees Celsius uh, to the ovens. And then, uh, and then well, breweries are a really potential one for us. Bread and beer, what's not to like? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. After the break, we'll be turning our attention to plastic and asking why, despite all our efforts, we're creating more of this stuff than ever before. Could a new global treaty be the solution? Welcome back to The Climate Show. Now, let me take you back a few years to when David Attenborough's Blue Planet 2 had just come out, provoking outrage about plastic in the sea. Sky launched its ocean rescue campaign. Many of us tried to shame brands into using less plastic. There was a plastic bag tax, a push back against plastic straws, and we discovered the virtues of reusable bottles. Well, it turns out that none of that has done anything to stem the growing tide of using single-use plastics. A new report shows that despite raising awareness and regulation, 139 million tonnes of plastic was generated globally in 2021, an increase of 6 million tonnes on 2019's levels. And that's really bad for waste, but also for the climate. Greenhouse gas emissions over the life cycle of single-use plastics in 2021 were equivalent to the total emissions of the whole of the UK but recycling is not proving to be the solution. 98% of the new plastic produced is what's known as virgin plastic, made from fossil fuels, and just 2% comes from recycling. Unfortunately, voluntary commitments are not going to get us out of this crisis. I think you know, what we've seen is that you know, consumer pressure, voluntary commitments from companies, you know, a little more political awareness, like that is not changing the trajectory. The problem is getting worse. Um, so you know, we really need like big interventions. So despite smothered sea creatures and a pollution menace, our global passion for plastic seems unquenched. So could law succeed where campaigns have largely failed? Interest is growing in an international treaty to work on this area, and I'm with one of the people who is working on it. That's uh, Chris Dixon from the Environmental Investigation Agency. Chris, what would this treaty be? OK, so um, in a best-case scenario, we're going to have a global, legally binding instrument that deals with the full life cycle of plastics. So basically from the moment that plastic is conceived as a material um, to the end of its life, so whether that's kind of in the environment or from a kind of waste management and leakage perspective. So covering that full spectrum of plastics as a material. So what would that oblige countries or companies to do, say in the production phase, first of all? So what it could do, um, and one of the things that we're really pushing for, is to have restrictions on polymers. So right now, um, you know, we have billions of polymers being created. They're the, the building the blocks. The ingredients of plastic. Exactly. Yeah. Everything that we have that's made of plastic comes from these polymers. But we don't really know the ingredients of them, but we know that some of them are containing, for example, harmful chemicals and additives. Um, we know that some of them are not necessary. They could actually just be phased out immediately. So what we could see the treaty doing is essentially capping and phasing down and phasing out the production of some of these polymers. And a smaller range of polymers also makes them easier to recycle, I gather. 
Exactly. Although, you know, I think we have to be really careful when we talk about recycling as a solution to the plastics crisis, because as we know, only about 9% of plastics that have been created have actually been recycled. Will this treaty have something on the disposal of plastic? You, you weren't too keen on recycling, but at least it's about pollution, so keeping it out of the natural world. Absolutely. This treaty will have obligations at every stage of the plastics life cycle. So that would include obligations on production, product design, but of course on waste management and waste management infrastructure, preventing leakage. You know, leakage is a huge area that we need to address, but there is already quite a lot happening on that downstream side, and there's not a lot happening on the upstream side. And in all those things, would it be about reducing, for instance, the carbon emissions in creating the plastic or regulating leakage from, from the refineries, for instance? Yeah, so I think it's really interesting to think about, you know, what the scope of this treaty could actually be, because we have at the moment, you know, oil and gas companies, they're really investing in um, plastic as a kind of plan B to reduce demand on the energy side. So we're seeing a huge build out of petrochemical facilities. And actually, we need to really think about, is that build, up, build out what we need? Um, it's carbon intensive, it's locking us into a system that we're actually trying to move away from. So the treaty, for example, could issue a moratorium on the building of new petrochemical facilities. Actually reducing the amount of plastic created? Yeah, I mean, we can't really do anything without reducing the amount of plastic that we're currently creating. Like, this is an unsustainable model. Is plastic bad? That's a really... Really tricky question, and I, mean, I know. You know <laughs> my phone case is made out of it. I think some of you coating on your bottle there, your reusable water bottle is made out of it. I mean, it, we find it so difficult to shed ourselves of it because it's so useful. Yeah, I think that plastic, you know, is always going to exist in some cases, you know, there'll be some essential uses and within a treaty on plastics, it's not saying we're going to get rid of all plastics for every application. It's saying what are the plastics that we're currently producing? Are they necessary? Are they safe? Do they contain toxic chemicals? Are they actually necessary at all? Could that application of plastic be either replaced with a different material or ideally a different system of delivery? I think that's why there's such a big movement around the concept of, you know, reuse systems, like keeping materials in circulation, you know, true circularity. We don't need to keep extracting in order to to live our lives why do you think campaigns well I'll put it to you have failed you know our appetite for plastic is going up not down despite all the passion yeah you know, we can see it around us here yeah well I wouldn't I wouldn't personally say that you know we failed as campaigners I think the fact that the global community has actually agreed to negotiate a new legally binding instrument to end plastic pollution that's like the title of the resolution to end plastic pollution and that is the United Nations we're talking about it's not it's not nobody I think that demonstrates the power of the campaigns that have been raising awareness about plastic pollution but one of the challenges is that a lot of the communications and narrative has been around pushing obligations onto the consumers you know if you reuse your bottle or or, you know, if you say no to plastic straws, you can address the plastics crisis. And that is an absolutely bonkers narrative. We really need to be thinking about a complete system change that doesn't rely on the continual extraction of natural resources and the rampant production of single-use plastics. Like, we don't need items that we're just going to use once to be wrapped in single-use plastic and then thrown away. But you will be asking countries and companies who make a lot of money out of this business to stop doing it. They're just going to say no or weasel their way out of it, like we see with fossil fuels, aren't they? Well, that's what we're really hoping that a treaty is going to help to address. And I think the fact that there's global appetite around legally binding measures, um, that's, that's a really strong starting point. But what we need to do is also you know, learn lessons from, for example, the climate agreement and think about the role of these massive plastics producers, what is their role in the negotiations? Should they have an equal voice to, for example, communities living um, in the defence line communities, living where petrochemical facilities are being built? You know, that is not an equal dynamic. When might we see the treaty coming in and maybe regulation over it? So the negotiations are going to conclude by the end of 2024 with the agreement open for adoption in 2025. So we're really going to start seeing some real movement on this um, in 2025. Well, thanks very much, Chris. Uh, we all know how difficult it can be, and Chris has alluded to it, to cut down our own use of plastics, but there is an idea that involves something from ages past. Who remembers the milk float? My name's Ella and I'm the founder of Top Up Truck. Top Up Truck is a mobile zero waste shop that helps people cut down on their plastic packaging from the convenience of their own street by bringing the shop to them on an electric milk float. I set it up because I believe that the continued use of single-use plastic is an abomination and even though I think that, I myself wasn't finding the time in my schedule prior to setting this up to actually get to the zero waste shop. 
Um, so I thought, how do we make it more convenient? Or what if the zero waste shop came to me? Hiya. How's it going? What are you after today? Can I get some of the organic brown rice. Sure. So obviously plastic is made, made from fossil fuels and it's completely unnecessary the degree to which we're using it. It's driven by um, supply rather than by demand. We don't actually need it. There's so many ways that we can kind of innovate around it. Obviously it's, it's, a very, it's very practical um, because it can get food products very safely and cleanly to people at a very low cost. But the the fact of the matter is it's, it stays around for years and years and years and, um, and it's just not needed. <laughs> That's great, thank you. I think we need a variety of ways and, and a variety of options for people in terms of refill offerings that are out there in the market and thankfully we're seeing a proliferation of different angles on it in terms of things getting ordered via direct mail and, and delivered to people's doorstep in returnable containers. We're seeing it happen in supermarkets. Obviously, um, there's loads of amazing independent um, sort of bricks and mortar zero waste shops as well. There we are. The top-up truck can help proliferate the number of access points to uh, refill, um, particularly in kind of uh, dense urban areas with more and more different solutions. It just offers consumers different ways that they can um, avoid single-use plastic. Now, I want to mention a report just out from the International Energy Agency, which says we're close to reaching a very significant tipping point. Now, we associate tipping points with being a bad thing, but in this case, it's about our energy mix and the fact that in just two years, renewables and nuclear will meet all the world's new electricity demands and start to displace fossil fuels too. That means emissions from generating electricity, which have continued to rise globally, will finally start to fall. And now, just before we go, a reminder that you can catch the Daily Climate Show at 3.30pm weekdays on Sky News. And you can get all the latest climate and environmental news on the Sky News app or website or by scanning the QR code on your screen right now. And if you have a burning question about the climate, scan the QR code on your screen right now and we'll do our best to answer it in future shows. And that's it from here on the banks of the Mersey. Join us next week when we'll be looking at plans for future cities and why they're generating such controversy. See you then. <laughs>